the Etihad Stadium, home of Manchester City. FA Cup finalists nine times, winners five. In the 2011-12 season, they won the Premier League title in spectacular fashion in the dying seconds of the final match. Their previous top flight title was 44 years earlier in 1968 with arguably their greatest ever team. One of them, Colin Bell, was voted the club's all-time best player. Other legendary players include Billy Meredith, who won the FA Cup with City in 1904. He's widely considered to be football's first superstar. Bert Troutman, a former German prisoner of war, played over 500 games for City. He famously broke his neck in the 1956 Cup final, but played on. This magnificent stadium, one of the biggest in the UK, was built to host the 2002 Commonwealth Games. But Manchester City haven't always played in such grand surroundings. In fact, the first match took place here on what was at the time an area of rough land. The match took place 13th of November 1880 against Macclesfield Baptist Church. The Baptists won the game 2-1, but the scorer for St Mark's was James Collinge, who therefore goes down as the first goal scorer in Manchester City's history. Now this area of rough land is very close to St Mark's Church, which the boys attended. Why is it that Manchester City Football Club first played under the name of a local church? The story starts here. On this site stood St Mark's Church in West Gorton. And its first rector who arrived in 1865, the Reverend Arthur Connell, was destined to become the first president of Manchester City Football Club. Now, Connell was a man who was deeply loved wherever he served, and people were always saddened when it was time for him to move on. For instance, when he was leaving the parish of Tully Lush, which is in the north of Ireland, um, Connell himself was an Irishman, his parishioners were devastated. But Connell felt called to Harrogate, and so, in 1859, he left Tully Lish for six very happy years in his first parish in England. But when St Mark's opened here in 1865, he was invited to become its first rector, and he took this position. At the time, West Gorton was still a semi-rural district on the fringes of Manchester, but it very quickly was absorbed into Manchester and suffered all the same social problems that its neighbour Manchester had. This included, of course, poverty, terrible housing, people living in cramped, squalid conditions with poor sanitation, and it became a parish with many, many needs, and it really kept Arthur Connell busy. By 1879, things had gone from bad to worse. There were more problems. One was drink. Men were spending money on drink that should have gone on food and clothing. Another was gang warfare, again, often fueled by drink. And it was clear that the people of the area were leading fairly desperate, meaningless lives. This was a situation that grieved Arthur Connell's eldest daughter, Anna, who was 27 at the time. She was convinced God wanted her to help these men. And convinced of this, she decided that the best way to help them would be to set up weekly working men's meetings at which she would share her faith in Jesus with them to give them hope and inspiration, and also to provide them with wholesome recreational opportunities as an alternative to the pub. Now that would have included things such as drama, singing, music, recitations, readings at the time. Anna set off, with her father's permission, to knock on the doors of all the houses in the parish, some 1,000 doors, quite a, an arduous task. And she said to them all, come to my meetings on a Tuesday, and I'm sure you will find this something very enjoyable. 
The very first Tuesday, she was to be bitterly disappointed because only three men turned up. And no doubt, she questioned whether she was really doing God's will or, or was it just some fanciful idea of her own. But she would not give up. She was so determined to help these men that she approached two senior officials of the church, Thomas Goodyear and William Bisto. Now, they were also senior officials at the Union Ironworks, which was the largest employer in the area. And Anna asked them to put out word of her meetings to the workforce there. Within a very short time, a matter of months, the three men had become 100. And among the people who joined those meetings were members of the St. Mark's Juniors Cricket Club, which William Bisto had set up the year before. Anna had a profound effect on those men through her meetings. In fact, within only a few months of starting them, they wanted to express their gratitude and they gave her a gift. Three years later, the same thing happened. They presented her with a beautifully bound Bible. And may I quote the words that they said? They wanted to give them to her in gratitude for the spiritual good which many of them experienced under her earnest and fervent addresses. And then several of the men stood up and spoke of, quote, the benefit they derived from their weekly meetings. Anna was so overcome with emotion that she couldn't respond, and her father had to speak on her behalf. Well, early in 1880, William Bisto, who was giving Anna great help with her meetings, had the idea of starting a football club. The idea was that the cricketers, the St. Mark's Juniors cricketers, should play football in the winter to stay fit for the following cricket season. And it was agreed enthusiastically by the cricketers that he spoke to, and so St. Mark's West Gorton Football Club was born, and Arthur Connell agreed to be its first president. Three name changes later, that little church club was to become known as Manchester City. It's amazing to think that it led to all this. What an incredible stadium. It all goes back to Arthur Connell, first president, in those early days at West Gorton. Although he didn't personally get things going, he was the man who endorsed the others who did. He was a great believer in the value of sport as a means of developing Christian character. And of course, by allowing his name to be attached to the club as president, and by letting it play in the name of the church, he was clearly making a statement of support. Anna, too, had a profound influence on so many of the players because they attended her meetings. The name Connell would have meant a great deal to those early pioneers. Now, Arthur, sadly, in 1897 became ill. He developed severe bronchitis and he lost his power of speech and he had no option but to resign. This was something he didn't want to do. His parishioners didn't want it either. In fact, they really pleaded with him to stay. Something we've seen has happened in other parishes. And at his farewell gathering, they said, a man teaches by what he is, and the sight of Mr. Connell walking through the streets would have reminded the people that his life and example was one they could follow. They were happy enough for him just to be there because he was so loved and admired, but his doctor made it absolutely clear it was out of the question. When the farewell presentation was made to Arthur, he couldn't respond. He had no voice. But knowing this, he'd already prepared what he wanted to say and asked his son-in-law, the Reverend John Dixon, to read out on his behalf his words. And this is what he said. I trust my preaching has been of no uncertain sound. Christ and him crucified was the theme on which I delighted to dwell, knowing there was no subject more saving in its power. 
Arthur moved for the good of his health to Southport, where it was felt that the sea air would do him good. It kept him going for another 18 months, but in February 1899, he died at the age of 77. So loved was he at St. Mark's that his body was brought back from Southport for his funeral at the church. That was two months before Manchester City were promoted to the top flight of English football for the first time. I wonder what Arthur, as president of that little St. Mark's football club, would have thought if he could see all this.